Okay, so the MOSFET model that we've developed so far is a very classical model in the sense that it does this quadratic behavior and we looked at that. So now some of the things that happen is that as you want to use these MOSFETs, you're trying to make them faster. And what makes a MOSFET faster? I mean, how can you make a transistor faster? What's the first order thing that you can do to make something faster? The transistors operate based on transition of charge, right? Moving from the source, let's say MOSFET, in MOSFET from, drain, from source to drain, right? Charge carriers. So if you want to increase the speed by which you can actually make these things happen, what is the first thing that you need to do? Make it a shorter trip, exactly. Make it smaller. Now, as you make the transistor smaller, it appears that, okay, well, everything should be great. And we talked about this a little bit. Of course, you need to scale the depletion regions and things of that sort because then everything needs to be working properly. And we'll see what the impact of not doing that is. But as you get to smaller dimensions, new effects come into play. And these effects will have impact on some of the parameters that matter for design, whether you're making analog or digital design with these transistors. So, so we're talking about short channel effects first. So remember when we had a transistor. So one of the basic things that we have in this model for the transistor is that you have these N pluses in an N FET or P pluses in a P FET, and you have a P bulk, P substrate. Now, you, on top of that, you have a gate oxide, and you have the gate terminal. So we have a VGS here, and then we have, this is your source, and we have a VDS here. Now, before you apply any voltages to this, let's say we, you don't even have any of these voltages, there is some built-in stuff that will happen. Now, let me ask you a question. What, is the, what does your VGS go towards when you, when you try to turn a transistor on? You have to apply a certain voltage for things to happen for it to turn on, right? So what are you spending that VGS on? What are the things that you're using VGS to produce? You're producing stuff happening down here by VGS. So one is to invert the channel, right? Create an inversion. The other thing that you're using some of the VGS, as we saw in the expression for the threshold voltage, is building this depletion region, right? There's a depletion region that you need to build up first before you can get to inversion, right? Because before inversion happens, depletion will happen. So you need to spend some voltage to get to depletion. Then you need to some, spend more voltage to get to inversion. Now, part of that effort goes into building depletion. But there is already some depletion region built. Because if you think about it, this is a PN junction, right? This is a diode, and this is a diode, right? So what, what happens here? If you think about it, there is some built-in depletion, even if I applied no voltage here. So I don't have to spend VGS to produce this part of the, VG, uh, of the depletion region, because it's already built in. It's already built. Now, this may not matter if these guys are far apart. But if you bring these drains close to each other, this depletion region will be forming a larger fraction of your total depletion region that you have to spend VGS on. So what do you expect to happen to your threshold voltage first as you make the L smaller? So think about the threshold voltage versus the channel length. Everything else being constant, I just bring these two closer and closer to each other. What would happen? to the threshold voltage. So at long channels, I have some threshold voltage, right? some value. The question is that when you get to shorter channels, would the VT go up or down? Do you need to spend more voltage or less voltage to, build, to start building that inversion layer? Before that, you need to make the depletion layer. Less. So your threshold voltage actually starts dropping with the channel length. So this is one of the first things that happens. Now, you may, you may think that, OK, well, no big deal. I, because I adjusted my threshold voltage anyway with my implantation charge, right? You remember? We said, OK, all of these work functions, everything, the surface charge, everything, whatever they give you, then we make an adjustment implant to make it correct to get, get it to the level we want. And that is true if you wanted to use your transistor with only one length. But one of the strengths and beauties of the MOSFET transistors is that you have two degrees of freedom. You can change the width of the transistor, and you can change the length of the transistor. And those are design parameters. So then if you have the same process technology with the same kind of level of doping, if you, bring, if you make a shorter channel or longer channel, they will, they're bound to have different threshold voltages, depending on what that is. So that's something to be mindful of and aware of. So that's one thing. The other question is, 
would you expect to have would you expect to have any dependence on the w based on the same ish same kind of general consideration of formation of the depletion region so make this let's make this three dimensional again okay so now it's three dimensional can you think of any effect that would result in a change in the threshold voltage with W? So we talked about the effect of L. This was L. And then the question is, what is the effect of W? Can you think of anything that would depend, any, result, any change due to the change in W? So if you look at the top down, let's think about this. If you look at, looked at this top down, this is the way it will look like, right? So you have. This is the source, this is the drain, and this is your gate, and this is the L, and this is the W. Right? Now, there's always fringe fields right, in a capacitor. So part of these field, electric field lines here are going sideways, and the, other way, the, the same way on the back side. So if you think about it here, these guys are going that way, and these lines are going this way. And as a result, you not only form a depletion region underneath here, you also extend your depletion region a little bit here because of this electric field. So you're forming a depletion region on the edges, on the outside edges of this thing. Now, if your width is large, this is a small fraction of the total field that you need to generate. So your VG is, using, is used somewhat for, I mean, a small fraction of it goes into making that. But as I make W smaller, what would, hap what would happen to the threshold voltage? It goes up, right? Because I need to spend more of that. This becomes a larger fraction of the total depletion region that I have to form. And as a result, I have to have a larger VG for doing that. So your threshold voltage is not really, it's not a constant, right? It depends on all of these things because of these effects, these two and three dimensional effects that you have. So that's the first thing that happens when the transistor scales. The other thing that now that we're talking about the depletion region to think about and talk about is what's the impact on the two, two effects that are related to each other, and we'll talk about that. The impact of bringing these depletion regions to, to closer to each other on the behavior of the transistor. So let's think about that. Let's go back to the energy band diagram. So we had a, for a standard basic long channel transistor, we had this energy band diagram that looked like this. And if you applied a voltage across, let's say you have a VDS across the, the transistor, and then you had something like that. If you didn't have a, large, a VGS applied to it, you still had a large potential barrier here that would stop these electrons, for example. I mean, a small fraction of them will go through still, but most of them are bounced back of the Boltzmann distribution or Fermi Dirac distribution. So think about this question. If I kept bringing these guys closer and closer to each other, what would happen to my energy band diagram? So, and, and the unbent energy band diagram looked like this, of course. Right? when there's no, the VDS is zero. So this is VDS zero, this is VDS greater than zero. So what would happen if I just start bringing these closer to each other without doing anything special about it? Would anything happen to that energy band diagram? Let's bring them close, a little bit closer. So let's say if, if they were instead of here, they were here. Nothing significant has happened, right? If I bring them closer here, still nothing. But if, if they're close enough that they are, let's say, the other junction starts here, what would, what would you expect the energy band diagram to look like? You expect the energy band diagram to look like that, right? Because they're going into each other. The depletion region is starting to meet. So you never form a full barrier. So it will look like this. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, let's say you, you apply a VDS to that energy band diagram. Well, so it would basically be like that. Is there a problem now? You get a lot more leakage current. Because essentially, your depletion regions are starting to meet, and your barrier is lowered. So what happens is that now everyone else can go through. And you can't turn this transistor off. Well, 
So your leakage current goes up. At some point, it may not even turn off properly. And even if the leakage current, and remember, this is an exponential dependence. Whether you look at it as Boltzmann or Fer, more accurately, Fermi Dirac, this is an exponential dependence. A little lowering of this potential barrier results in a lot more leakage. That was the entire behavior of the PN junction diode and bipolar transistor was based on just lowering of the barrier and things will go through, right? So this is a significant problem. Now, this problem can actually, actually happen because of other things. Because if you have a drain voltage that's lowered, what it does is that it, it starts inducing some of the field is extended. And your electric, and your, even if you have a long enough channel, you can have a lowering of the potential here. And this is called drain-induced uh, barrier lowering, or dibble for short. So what happens is that you have to be careful about these effects, because then they can actually, you will have currents when you don't expect to have current. So when you design your transistor, if you're a device designer, you have to be aware of this. And if you're a circuit designer, you have to be aware of the impacts that this kind of changes will have on the transistor. Now, so that's basically kind of a static threshold level thing. But then there are other things that are even more dynamic and more prominent, perhaps, in a shorter channel transistor. Like we said, we are trying to make the transistor smaller to make it faster, right? But let's go back to the basic behavior of the transistor. So let's say we did this calculation earlier. And we said the channel in the, the, the charge in the channel, what is the total charge in the channel if you have a small VDS? So let, this is before you even get to the pinch off and things of that. So let's say you have a VGS here. And then you have a VDS here. So let's say it's an N type. It can be a P type, doesn't matter. Um, so what is the total charge in the channel induced? We did this as our first order calculation, right? We say the inversion charge in the channel was W, L, C, ox, VGS minus VT, right? So that was the charge in the channel. And then you remember when we said how we calculated the first order approximation for the transistor current, we said, well, we calculated the tau f, the time it takes this charge to go from source to the drain. So we, the way we calculated there is that it was, was the length divided by the drift velocity. And then what we did in that case, we said, OK, well, the drift velocity, if the field is small, is proportional to the electric field is mu e. So that was the basic calculation. But now, what if it's not proportional? What if it's the field is not small enough? If the field is not small enough, we did this, we did this early on, I think in the first or second lecture, is that we, did, we saw that the velocity, the drift velocity, versus the electric field behaves like this. There is something called velocity saturation. And there's a field we call E critical, or E sat. So E critical is the point at which the, the, the estimated velocity based on mu E, let's say this is mu E sat, the velocity here is half of that. So basically, it's mu E sat over 2. And this is we call what we call V sat. And you remember why this happened, right? Why did this happen? Why would the velocity, you remember that we talked about the reason that, first of all, the velocity was proportional to the electric field inside a semiconductor for the charge carrier. Because in vacuum, that's not the way it is, right? If I have an electron in vacuum, what is it that, that's proportional to the electric field for this? If I apply electric field to a, to a charge particle, to an elect, let's say an electron in vacuum, what, what is the parameter that's, if let's say I have constant electric field, what would be constant mechanically? Acceleration, Acceleration right? Because that's what determines the force. Electric field times the charge would be the electric force. The f and then the electric force, Newton's law, whatever, just the second law, just et cetera, right? So it's the acceleration that's constant. We went through all this discussion about why this randomization of the movement of the, due to the thermal velocity makes it that the drift velocity is constant with the electric field. It's proportional to the electric field, not the acceleration. Now, but that starts to fail at some point, that assumption. When does it start to fail? When the velocities that you're inducing by this electric field 
become comparable. They don't have to be exactly equal, but even like a, a small fraction of the thermal velocity, they be, this assumption starts to fail. And what's, what's a physical thing that's happening there? So the electrons are starting to accelerate more in between the collisions. So you're having an impact on their net velocity. It's not dominated entirely by the thermal velocity. So this saturation happens. This is kind of, and, and this is the, the point we calculate. But now, let's say your channel is so short that for the vo velocity that you've applied, you are in this region of the electric field. And as you shrink the, the channel, this will happen, right? Unless you shrink your, your voltages equivalently, right? So here's a practical matter from a circuit design perspective. So when we started at five micron transistors, when we say five micron transistors, we mean like five micron, L is five microns. So you have a transistor that whose length is 5 micron. And the operation voltage for those, let's say, digital gates made out of those things was about 5 volts. Then people went to, let's say, smaller, like 1 micron. And then they kind of lowered it to 3.3 volts. And then they went to half a micron. They were at 3.3 volts. They went to 2.5 volts. Then they went to 1. So they couldn't really scale, keep up with the scaling in terms of voltages. And the reason was that 1 was the threshold. Because the problem is that if your threshold is too low, there, is a, there will be a problem. And if your threshold is too high, then you will not get sufficient overdrive. This is what we call the gate overdrive. And we'll talk about this extensively later. But gate overdrive to drive the transistor sufficiently so it can be fast enough. By the way, what's the problem that you will get if your threshold is too low? If your threshold was 0, what would happen? or negative. The transistor doesn't turn off. And you know that that's a problem, right? So you need to have a sufficiently high threshold so you don't have much of a sub-threshold current. Once you have sufficiently high threshold voltage, it means that you will not have enough gate overdrive with the typical supply that you use, at least in the digital circuit. So you are, you are basically kind of stuck with the, between a rock and a hard place. And even today's digital circuit, the fastest digital circuit that you have on chip, they are a little bit over, less than a volt. But now we've gone from five, microns, 5 volts for 5 microns to a little bit less than a volt for, let's say, 14 nanometers. So you can see that the voltage hasn't scaled as fast as the rest of the stuff. So, so, and as a result, you're applying more and more field across the, the channel. Because the rate at which the channel has shrunk, the L has, has shrunk at a much faster rate than the VDS. So the VDS over L, which is the electric field, is going higher and higher. And therefore, in a lot of situations, you may be actually in a case that you're deeply velocity saturated. So if you're deeply velocity saturated, what would happen to this equation? Well, this gets replaced. This V becomes V, v, v sat, essentially. You can approximate as V sat. So it basically becomes L over V sat. And then, as a result, what you will see is that now, if, you if we plug this in, you get L over mu E sat over 2. And you go back to the calculation of the current, ID would be Q channel divided by tau f, which is this divided by that. So you get mu n C ox over 2 W E sat VGS minus VT. Instead of that before, we, for a long channel device, we had mu n C ox over 2 to say the same thing. We had W over L and VGS minus VT squared. So you've gone from, in this, this is the other end of the spectrum. This is the deeply velocity saturated device. So it becomes linear with VGS as opposed to quadratic. Now, it's good if you're trying to make a linear device, but it means that you have this weaker dependence between VGS and ID, which means that probably your gain is going to be limited, more, more lower, the analog gain of the system. The other thing that you will see is that there's no dependence on L here in this limiting case. So from the current perspective, making the transistor smaller doesn't give you more current for the same VGS like before. So you may say, think that, OK, well, so then why are you scaling it down anyway? Because we are not getting more current for the same voltage. So is there any point to scaling still? Is there any point to scaling? 
Well, so that, oh, that's a good point. So, so one, one point is that, well, said the density of the devices. If you scale them down, you get more devices. And that's true. That is definitely true. But in terms of speed, do we get another, another advantage? Sorry. You, tau goes down, right? Correct. This guy still goes down, right? Now, why does this matter? Because, you know, the Q is also going down. It matters because then when you think about the total capacitance, another way to think about it is the total capacitance, the channel capacitance. There are two things that determine the speed, and we'll get, get into this in more detail. But a switching speed of something, and also the amplification speed, things are determined by things. If I, want, if I ask you, how quickly can I move this around? This, let's say, marker. If I move, try to move it as fast as I can, what are the two things that are limiting me? Well, let, let's say my, my Let's say, okay, let's, let's go through that and we'll talk about that, simplifying the assumption we're making. So let's say, let's say I take a big heavy object. Um, I, I don't see a heavy object. That's not going to cause a lot of fun for people to move around. But let's, let's say this is a heavy object. I'm trying to move it around as fast as I can. There are really two things that determine to first order how fast I can do this. What are they? The amount of force I can apply and? How mass and mass, right? F equals ma, or a is f divided by m. So the, f the drive capability, the force, the current, and the mass, the capacitance. That's a simplistic way to think about it, but it's a pretty accurate way to think about it. I mean, a lot of things you can actually answer when we get to the circuits with this way of thinking. So if you want to make something faster, either you have to, either I have to become stronger and be able to apply for more force and change my force rapidly. Now, I'm, of course, limited in this case by the mass of my arm, not really the mass of this thing. But if it was a heavy object, then it would be limited. That was what I was talking about earlier. Uh, but anyway, the other thing, or, or make it less massive. So in this case, you say, well, the force doesn't scale down. The drive, we call it a drive, right? The drive doesn't scale down. But the capacitance still does, if you think about it. Because there was this 2 third or total, like I mean, w, WLC ox, there's an L in there. And we'll see that it exhibits itself, but the rate at which the speed increases is now going to be linear with L, as opposed to quadratic before. Because when you had a linear device, this scaled with L, and the capacitance scaled with L. Right? And then both of them, if both of them scale with L, then you get an L squared dependence. But in this case, you just get a factor of L. And then the other things that come into play are that how much of your capacitance is really coming from the channel. Because even in a standard MOSFET design today, the transistor really looks like this. So this is your gate. This is your gate oxide. Three atoms thick, um, or so, maybe four, three, something like that. Um, and then this is your drain and source. So now think about it. Of course, this is a pretty thin dielectric. So there is large amount of field, but there's also a lot of other field lines somewhere else, right? They're fringe fields. So the question is, how do you design it? How, what fraction of it is coming from which? And then you have to think about that. So that's another thing to think about. But now, if you take this velocity saturated model, you can also write an expression that's slightly more general. So it basically is an interpolation between these two extremes, which is a reasonable thing to do if you're trying to come up with an expression. Again, we don't use this expression quite frequently, but it is there, which basically means that um, it's a similar expression to what we had before. It's a mu n C ox over, um, and then W over L, VGS minus VT squared. But then you add a correction term to it, right? And the correction term you have you put it here, it's VGS minus VT over E sat times L. There's a two here. So what do we get from this? If you look at this expression, let me just make it a little bit cleaner here. When this expression, when VGS minus VT is much smaller than E sat over L, it means that you don't have enough overdrive. Basically, your channel, you're not your long channel, and you get the original expression for the quadratic, right? And if this becomes significantly larger, then you can see that this guy cancels one of those, and you get this expression. 
So it's an expression that transition between these transitions between these two. So if you want to have one thing that captures all of it, it's this. Now, if you want to make a computer model for it, for it, this is fine. If you still want to design, nine out of 10 times we don't use this. But there is this expression that you can use if you need it. All right, any questions on that? Okay, if not, I'd like to talk about several other variations on transistors. And these are the things that are important for us to think about as the transistors become smaller and smaller. So we talked about these limitations. And the key question is now, how can we make the transistor faster as we get smaller? So what are the problems? What are the problems that you can imagine in this case, for example? If you're making a field effect transistor and you're trying to make a better transistor as you make it smaller, what do you think are the parameters that you're trying to control and change? What determines the speed of the transistor? And you also mentioned the area density efficiency, right? That was a good thing, too. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about it. And then you will see why we are doing transistors today the way we are doing them. And again, 10 years from now, we may be doing some other things. But this is the way we, will be, we are doing it today. Uh, so what is the primary function of a transistor? Think about it. You're trying to have, it's a control. I mean, it goes to the name, right? Trans resistor. It's a controlling of a th the, the current between two other terminals, either through changing the resistor or the current between them, by a third terminal. So we talked about this earlier. If you make the gate oxide thicker, you're removing the, ther the, the controlling terminal, terminal from the controlled, which is the channel. So if you want to exert the maximum amount of control over the channel, what do you need to do? Now, think about it. Geometrically, this channel is this volume underneath, underneath this gate oxide, right? If I want to exert more control through field, which is the field effect transistor, right? What do I need to do to get, exert more control over that channel? We talked about this earlier. We said we got to get closer, right? Either electrically or mechanically. I would even say, if, or geometrically. So, well, we talked about mechanically make this thinner. Well, you get to a couple of atoms, it's going to be hard to make it thinner because then now you will have tunneling. Somebody mentioned tunneling a couple of lectures ago. Now you have tunneling of the current. So now you will have current going through the gate. Tunnel, this is really quantum mechanical tunneling just going through that barrier. Um, so there's a limit on that. So how do we get around that? Electrically, we get closer. We can say, OK, well, you know what? Instead of five, three atoms, I can put five atoms. But if it's a higher dielectric constant, then C ox is going to be high, the, the same. Because it's, you know, Cx is going to be higher because it's basically epsilon oxide over T ox. If my epsilon is higher, I can live with a, t, a large, larger T ox. Or if I have the same T ox, I can have a higher epsilon as my C ox is increasing. So that way, I can get more control. These are the parameters, knobs of control. Mobility, we'll talk about mobility in a second. Um, we can play with mobility too, a little bit. Uh, but, and remind me if I didn't mention it uh, in a second, talk about that. But before we even get that, there, I said geometrically. What can you do about the geometry? Let's say you can have, this is an example. If, let's say you could build anything that's possible to fit, build. A device that you give it, give it a three-dimensional map of atoms and it will build it for you, something like that. Let's say such thing existed. How would you make your transistor? To exert more control. Yes? The channel would be a rod or cylinder. Yeah, so this is an interesting proposal, right? He said the channel would be a rod or cylinder, and then your gate would be wrapped around it. Because this way, you're not coming only from one direction. You're coming from all around. Actually, people have attempted to do this. And, and this is basically the, the vertical gate transistor. So basically, this becomes the drain. Then you wrap the gate around it. So this is your gate, and this is your source. Now, making these kind of things is hard in a reliable fashion. So there are variations. So what if you couldn't, instead of doing, for example, just one direction, you said, OK, I, don't want to, I cannot get to it from all four directions if you have like a channel passing, right? And if it's, rec if it's a rectangular, there would be four different orientations. Right now, we're approaching it from one, from the top, right? What if I could approach it from more than 
one direction. How could you do that? What is a good compromise between this ideal device that you suggested and this? Is there something in between? OK, put another gate on the bottom. So that, that, we'll get there. We'll, we'll talk about that. So that, that also reminds me. So that's a side branch of thought. Um, and then there's another thing we need to talk about here. Um, so we'll put markers here. But that's good. We'll, we'll get to that. But even, between, even if you couldn't put something underneath, can you, can you make the geometry a little bit different? So at least you get a, to, to three sides out of four sides of a rectangular channel. Well, they call it a fin fet. Because they make a fin of semiconductor. I call it a fin. Not a huge fan of that name, but it's a pretty common name nowadays. So, and then you put your gate, you wrap your gate around it. So you basically, you have a gate oxide around this. So you have a dielectric. And then you have your conductor going around that dielectric. So it's wrapped around that. And the way it really looks like is more like this. So I'm, so I'm going to try to do a. 3D approximation of what it kind of looks like. So you have a terminal on this side. Uh, this doesn't look good, but anyway, it's good enough. So, so let's say you have that. And then you have this fin coming in. Of course, this will be obscured by whatever is connected here. And that's your fin, right? And then your gate is going over part of this, so it's just wrapped around this thing. There's a, of course, it has to be oxidized. It has to be some dielectric. It may not be oxide. And then this is going to go over that. So there's this like blanket going around it and making something like that. So this is your gate. This is your source and drain. And this is called a fin fet. Fin fet. I think that makes more sense, actually. So it looks like a fin that you're trying. And this way, you get apply electric field from all three sides. In practice, they don't make it like that. Most of the, I mean, most recent ones, if you look at the cross section of it, it's like some sort of a V if you cross it here. Because it's easier to build and kind of like connect. And it doesn't matter. You basically get the field from most of the sides. Right? You don't get the bottom side field, but you have the gate wrapped around it. Of course, there's a gate. There's some sort of a dielectric between them. And this way, you get exert more control over the channel. So these are called fin fets. The other question is, can you create a, something that has more control from the bottom? Or you don't have to worry about the bottom. That's the pathway you've talked about. So there are different ways to go about that. One of the interesting things that they do is that the way we, the transistors, the way we talked about them, is that they are built on a, on, a subs, on a bulk. Now, of course, when you have a PMOS, so this is the P sub, when you have a PMOS, you have to have another layer of semiconductor, which is going to be n-type, so that's called, called a well. But all of them are still attached to each other electrically, right? So you have all these PN junctions that are separating these different devices from each other. And PN junctions, we know, have capacitances. So what if we could actually use something that produces less capacitance? What if we could create an island of silicon, a small island of silicon that's sitting on some sort of a dielectric? So let's say this is the dielectric. For example, silicon dioxide. And this is silicon. The black is silicon. And then within that, you make your own device. So you, make, you can make an N plus and an N plus. And then you can have your gates and the subsequent things that will happen. You have gate, the gate dielectric and the gate. and it's So what this does is that it eliminates this capacitance on the bottom. And it allows you to make a very compact device, right? Because you, you have basically something that can be an independent island. You, don't have, you can actually connect to this island, which in this case would have to be P-type. Um, you can have put a P plus here and make a contact here, or you can leave it open or float. These kind of devices are called SOI, silicon and insulator. You may have heard 
And what this does is that by applying the field, you have more confinement of field and also have more separation, so you have smaller capacitance. Now, if you want to control it from the back side by applying voltages here, you can control it. You can actually do the same thing with that P, P fit in a well, but there's a lot more capacitance. And when we talk about the back gate transistor, you will see that. So you are actually controlling the backside J FET. There's a J FET on the backside. We briefly mentioned this, and we will see this more in more detail, that any MOSFET made the regular way or this way is basically a, a field MOSFET in the front and a J FET in the back. And this combination, the two parallel transistors are working together. So you're using the backside in that way. But now if you do SOI, so this is basically the silicon on insulator, the advantage is that you can make this, if you don't try to control it from the backside, you can make this pretty small, and you get much less capacitance here because you don't have a PN junction here anymore. The, the, it's an interesting question of how you build them. The very interesting discussion, there are various ways of making them, but that's a different discussion we are not going to get into. But what do you think the problem with, with something like this would be if I don't make any of these contacts? If I try to make a transistor like this, can somebody think of a problem with this? So the statement is, if you have a lot of transistors that are working with different gate voltages, the gate voltages for one would may do something different from the other one, because these are essentially floating, right? It's a good point, I mean, pointing in the, exactly the right direction, which is that these floating islands can ac accumulate charge, right? And if they get charged up, depending on how much charge there is on them, the operation of the transistor, the threshold voltage would, would change. So these guys actually have memory. Their operation, the threshold, depends on, unless you kind of create that extra contact, depends on what past operations they've done, I mean recently, and how they were operated. And that sets up the amount of charge that's in this island, which would control the threshold and all those things. So there's a trade-off. But, but SOI devices are very useful, particularly for high-frequency RF kind of things. Now, we talked about, we said, we'll come back to mobility. So there, the knobs are here, right? They're in front of our face, right? These are design knobs. These are voltage knobs, which can be design knobs or not control. These are, this is, we talked about this. We said C aux being um, epsilon aux uh, over, you know, the T aux. So basically means that if you use a different material other than the oxide, a different di dielectric, we talked about this, or make it thin. So we've talked about this. The thing that we haven't really talked about is this guy, mobility. You say, well, what can we do about mobility? It's property of the material, right? I mean, how much it, the, the velocity, the, the, this, it's the slope of this line. It sounds to be very fundamental, more fundamental. Yes, it is true, but you can start changing the material. Now, you can change the material in different ways. One way to change the material is to say, look, I will use a different material. And this was one of the things that gallium arsenide was promising 20, 30 years ago. And the joke was that gallium arsenide would be the technology of the future where all the computers will be made out of and will remain that way. It will remain the technology of the future. And it has remained that way. No, there, are no, there are not that many gallium arsenide-based computers today. They are still made out of silicon. Now, there are other problems with gallium arsenide we can get into. But what if you wanted to say, OK, I'm not going to entirely change my material. Can we do something to the material where it matters, which is the surface here, so that it becomes better in terms of mobility? And that's one of where one of the, there are many solutions, there are many thoughts on that. And one of them is this concept of strain silicon. So what they you do, so what if you could push the atoms of the silicon? Well, let's keep it on this one. We have kept everything here. Um, Let's say the atoms of silicon are forming some sort of a lattice, right? We know that it's a diamond lattice, but I'm going to show it for simplicity as a rectangular lattice. So this is the thing. What if I could make these atoms be a little bit farther apart or closer? That would certainly change the properties of the material, right? In terms of semiconductor behavior, the mobility and all those things, right? Because the electrons will experience a different thing. Now, and you may say, how the heck are you going to do that? How are you, uh, this, these atoms are, the, the crystal structure is formed. There's some spacing that's a natural, that's dictated by the thermodynamics of 
or not even thermodynamics, it's actually with quantum mechanics of the interaction of these things. So there's an energetically minimal place spacing between them. So how are you going to do that? How can you, how can I stretch silicon atoms? Can you think of a way? Therm well, thermal, yes, thermally we could do that. That's, that's actually interesting thinking. Um, you could do that, but the price is pretty high because then you lose on the mobility side significantly because of the temperature dependence on that. And um, so it, it, it ends up not being, but no, so, something that actually fundamentally the material has changed now. The transistor is, the, this material silicon where it matters is different. I want to actually make it like this if I can. Can we do it that way across the channel? Can we make this lattice be like that? Just apply physical, physical force. Yeah. So, so yeah, the lattice will fall apart I mean, if, 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 if you do that. If, if you do that because, on, because you have to do it on a microscopic level. But you're on the right track. You have to create that force as the crystal is growing. How can you create that force as the crystal is growing? Well, you can grow it on a crystal that has a larger, that has the same crystalline structure, but has a larger lattice spacing. So think about it. If you want to make grow silicon on something that has a similar crystalline structure but has a different lattice spacing, what would that be? What would be a good candidate? Carbon, Carbon would have smaller or larger spacing. Yeah, but so th right track, wrong direction. Germanium. So if I grow it on germanium, the germanium has a different lattice spacing. The germanium lattice spacing is this. So when you do that, grow it on this, these guys try to match. And eventually, they will, of course, they will converge. They will have to go back to the lattice spacing of silicon. So they will try to. As you grow, eventually it will go back to a lot of spacing of silicon. But over a shorter distance, you get strained silicon. It's called strained silicon. And that's what they actually do. They strain the silicon. They st it's stretched because it's grown. So that's one of the tricks that they play. Now, you don't need to actually do it under. So you can do it underneath. You can have a little bit of germanium and grow it under. So that's a wafer level thing. Or you could actually implant germanium in these regions. Actually, they do it usually for PFETs. So you have a P plus and P plus, and they implant germanium here. So basically, you basically make an alloy of germanium and silicon. And this alloy has a start, start, larger lattice spacing, so it starts stretching it this way. Or you mentioned carbon. Actually, you were also right on that front. Or for an n-type, you can actually put carbon atoms here and it strains it. So you create either tensile or compressive uh, strain in the crystal that would change the mobility. By not insignificant amounts. I mean, just like there can be significant amount of change in the mobility, and you enhance the mobility. So there are a lot of these concepts, but all of them really goes back to understanding what the fundamental knobs are. And then you need to think about new structures, new geometries, new materials, new techniques, new, new ways of fabricating things that allow you to turn these knobs in a way that would allow you to push the limits of the performance of these devices. And you can see a lot of it's like basic understanding of the energy band diagrams, the, 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 the solid state device physics, solid state physics involved behind the device physics. All right? Any questions? Yes? You said that velocity saturation is generally negligible on a first order analysis. So what would you say, or at what note would you say that lambda, the channel length parameter for channel length modulation, at what note does that become important? Uh, Oh, you mean the, I, I didn't say the velocity saturation is negligible. Or, or if I said I misspoke then, uh, uh, that the velocity saturation, sorry. For a first order thing analysis. Right. So you mean for the, the channel length modulation? The channel length modulation, yes. The channel length modulation is important. And you will see, we'll encounter channel length modulation when we, when we come here. Um, so if you remember, we had talked about the channel length modulation being um, impacting the, the drain current when the VG, VDS changes. So we had this. This, is, this matters. This, in fact, you will see that this will determine the in maximum intrinsic gain of a transistor. So the maximum intrinsic gain of a transistor is determined by lambda or equivalently by the early voltage associated with that. So 
it, it's extremely important to understand it. And that's why we spend a lot of time talking about this rather second order effect because it becomes a limiting parameter. Well, so the question is that do we always do it that way? Dep not necessarily. Not necessarily. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. Well, do always do the analysis with the minimum simplest model that allows us to understand the effect that we're talking about and no more because, again, when you're dealing with circuits with 50 transistors, you want to be dealing with the issues that are relevant and will impact you. And for some of the transistors, you will talk about the channel length modulation. And for some of them, you say, well, it doesn't matter here because this is not the first order effect, so we just completely ignore it. So we are very selective about where we apply these things. And that really goes back to understanding what limits what. As we go to the block diagrams next, we will see that in certain conditions, what are the conditions where this matters and what are the conditions that it doesn't matter? Any other questions? All right, very good. <laughs>